Chapter 25, Generous Souls. We stand at the dawn of a new golden age, where others merely survive, we thrive. And while I have led your efforts, it has been by your own strength. Because yes, freedom is what we all work towards. Alone, I had given my possessions, even my barding, to calamity. Night poppy seed had brought me soiled, filthy slave clothes to wrap myself in. Thick wrappings had gone around my right foreleg to hide my pet buck, complete with twigs and bloodstains to suggest my leg had been crudely wounded. If any pony asked, I intended to tell them I had been run through by a piece of rhubarb. Then I had been shackled, as the slavers before, Poppy Seed had been unable to shackle me properly at the hoof thanks to my pit buck. So she had locked the manticles above my knees. I floated myself to the cage of a slave wagon and bedded down with moldy hay filled with small itchy bugs. It had taken only minutes to become wretchedly uncomfortable. Between that, nearly getting fucked in the tail by a giant flaming Pinkie Pie the evening before, I had been deemed to look decently pathetic. I had been allowed to attach a few bobby pins to my rags. That, but I would have hoped that I could find a screwdriver somewhere on the other side of the wall. Then, with worried goodbyes, my companions left me alone. I was to lay there and wait for a member of Red Eye's slavers, whom the Steel Rangers had sufficiently bribed or perhaps ensured the cooperation of, in less wholesome ways, to come and get the slave wagon. I had forgotten what it felt like to be alone. I had spent my whole previous life alone. I hadn't had any friends growing up, and my mother, as much as I loved her, wasn't the sort of parent a filly would feel together with. Alone is cold, and dull, and miserable. It was a void that ached, to be filled. And my little hobbies and distractions that I had turned to had never really filled that hole, because it was a hole I could only be filled with companionship. Growing up, the closest thing I had to that was music. The singing on the Stable 2 broadcast. At least with music, there was another pony involved, who was trying to make a connection. And I could pretend that pony was trying to make a connection specifically with me, not just any pony who was listening. The illusion was never perfect, and I couldn't be held beyond the song. But while the music was playing, the mirage of friendship helped protect me against the cold. Needless to say, it was the songs of Velvet Remedy which I had cherished the most. I had even fallen in love, I think, with my dream of her. I still remembered the the hurt when my ridiculous and unrealistic image of her was shattered by the real thing standing in the train car, a non-prisoner in a slaver town. And even then, I think, I still clung to little fragments of my dream remedy until the day she shot me. That said, I wouldn't have traded my real friendship with the actual pony for anything, much less a relationship with my two-dimensional daydream. What I had was better, far better, because it was real. When I left Stable 2, my life changed forever. And the most dramatic, dramatic and drastic change wasn't the vast open wasteland or the sickly sunlight that pushed its way through the clouds. It wasn't the horrors and wickedness and cruelty I had seen, or the daunting amount of pain I had suffered, or even the growing river of pony blood drowning my hooves. The most drastic change was friendship, and it started just a few days out of the stable with a pony named Calamity. Calamity was unlike any pony I'd ever met. He was fearless and noble, and just in a way that I could only aspire to be. And he cared about me in a way no pony, not even my mother, ever did. He was willing to stand by me, 
even when I was being foolish and wrong. Not that we ever never disagreed, because we often did, but he gave me the benefit of the doubt. He trusted me, and he was some pony I knew I could trust in return. I freely admit that I have been jealous when Calamity and Velvet Remedy has started to gravitate towards each other. And in retrospect, I have to wonder, was my conviction that they were a couple ready, accurate, or a self-fulfilling prophecy? How foolish I would feel if I was wrong. But friendship was, and still is new to me, and I had many lessons to learn about it, and many, many more to go, if the sheer number of Spike's stories were to be believed. Only after I had come to accept their closeness and take comfort in it was my heart really open enough to embrace homage. I had friendship, but the void goes deeper than that. I wanted more than companionship. I yearned for love and physical intimacy. I will admit that when homage first opened up the possibility, I was drawn to her out of desperation. But that changed. She changed that. Likewise, I would not blame the pony for thinking that our relationship had been fast and brief. But while it is true that I had not met her in a coat in Maine until Ten Pony Tower, I had gotten to know much of her before seeing her face to face as she had gotten to know me. In truth, I have known homage almost as long as I have known calamity. True, I had not known her deeply and personally until Ten Pony Tower, but who really knows their friends that well in the first place in the first few weeks? And I can safely say that the connection we had built before the meeting was laid on a solid foundation. I can say this thanks to the great part of the honesty that I realize homage embodies. The homage I knew, and I grew to know as DJ.3, was and is the real homage. Not all of her, granted, and not without trappings, but real, all the same. Homage knows me at my very best, but she has also seen me at my worst. And instead of being scared away, she has embraced me and let me in. She has held and comforted me, and she has done so much more, allowing me an intimacy that I only daydreamed about before, and usually to my private shame. With homage, I didn't feel ashamed. Having seen the memories of Steel Hooves, a melancholy realization had crept into my thoughts. He was the only of my companions who had been in a similar relationship. Yet, unless Calamity and Velvet Remedy had managed to be up to things with far greater degree of sneakiness and stealth, than I attribute to either of them. Like me, he had a companion whom he could trust to be open and honest with him. And like me, he chose to keep things from her. I'm quite sure he did not reveal to Applejack the murder he committed. Whereas in my case, I have kept from homage, well, another murder still who's committed. Thinking on these things, I suddenly found the parallel downright creepy. Sulu's once told me that I would learn that he wasn't a better pony, which I certainly have seen as true, just like she said. And while I can only guess at what befell their relationship, I do know that he and Applejack were together the day the bombs fell, and I must assume they at least worked at mending any damage his dark secrets had caused. And I also know that, ultimately, she left him. She chose her family over him, and she left him behind. And he's been living without abandonment for 200 years, alone. With an aching heart and a sense of unease, I found myself desperately needing to talk to Homage. With any luck, I would be able to as soon as my friends had the override installed. I wondered 
if I would be able to speak with her just by talking to the air. For from what I heard, it seemed more likely that I would need to go, I would need to get to the station myself to have real communication with her. Either way, I was determined to come clean. For better, or for worse. Unlike the hobbies and distractions of my lonely truth and youth, friendship really can fill the void enough for a pony to be happy. And while I wouldn't normally consider my experiences in the Equation Wasteland to be happy ones, I really have been happier out here than I ever was in Stable 2. Being with friends is a blanket against the cold, a bulwark that makes you stronger, a connection that makes you bigger. Without friends, I was exposed, weak, and small. And, on an unrelated note, itchy. Chain-linked fencing crackled with energy, surrounding a barricaded outer gate. Guards watched with amusement as the slaver pulled my wagon to the wall. Only one? A guard mare called out. She was heavily barded and wore a battle saddle bearing four combat shotguns. The sight made me cringe. A whole wagon? For just one? Been slacking, Nash? The slaver pulling my wagon just grunted. I scratched on my neck with a hind hoof and tried not to wince every time the wagon jolted as it rolled over the broken, rocky streets. I unrealistically hoped that slaves were given baths. And such a small one, too. A guard buck in similar barding came out. I noticed that I couldn't see any weapons on him, save for his horn and hooves. I wonder if that made him more or less dangerous. If it wasn't a unicorn, I'd say toss it back in the lake. Itching badly, I really wished I could be tossed in a lake. It occurred to me, however, this was not the first time a slaver had suggested unicorns were considered an extra valuable prize. Not entirely surprising, considering that the unicorns in Stable 2 were often expected to go into technical work, thanks to the fine manipulation our magic allowed. I wonder what work Red Eye was putting us to. I'd probably find out soon enough. While Quadruple's shotgun pony kept aim on me, her male counterpart threw a lever, killing the electric crackle in the chain link fence. He hoofed a button, and a section of the fence began to roll up with a considerable chatter. Quadruple combat shotgun pony continued to keep a battle saddle trained on me. A single unicorn, shackled and caged, added to snipers hidden within steel bunker towers on either side of the wall's inner gate. The heads of patrol ponies could be seen walking the perimeter of the wall on a raised platform just behind it. Even knowing me, I felt the ridiculous amount of overkill. A griffin arced overhead, checking out the latest arrival, and flew away, laughing. By the you-know-who, Gash. When I first saw this one, I thought you'd bucked your horseshoes and actually brought in a filly, the mare snickered, making me feel even smaller. I was thinking maybe I ought to blow your head off before Stern got to you. Nash, my chauffeur, merely grunted again. What's this? The guard buck asked, peering in at me. His horn glowed, and a jagged, rusty spear jutted in between the bars at me. I cringed back. The unicorn frowned at me, and tipped the spear so that its head caught on the bloody, blood-soaked wrapping around my hip buck and fell away. Crap! I wasn't even the gate, and the plan was falling apart. Oh, he said with a smiling grunt. Think you're a clever pony, don't you? He gave me a cruel ear. Let's see how clever you feel inside. Inside? Did he intend to rape me? I wondered that with a shot of panic, or just let me through the gate. The guard mare shot him a look, and then gave a cruel laugh. Oh, please, do it. Help, here, let me help her, help hold her down. 
She gave her companion an evil smirk. Fifteen minutes of fun. If that, and you'll be scratching at the hay bugs, biting your sheath for a week. I suddenly felt thankful for the infested hay. The buck back up with a fearful look, then scowled at the mare. You'd really enjoy that, wouldn't you? More than life itself. What a disgusting couple. Bah! He hit the button to close the outer gate and waved a hoof towards the sniper ponies. Let it through! He gave me one more look. This one barely contained revulsion. His eyes moved to the pit buck, now partially visible through the wrappings. Oh, and tag her to see Dr. Slaughter. She's got one of them leg terminals that are a bitch to get off. For a pony who had been so sorely disappointed that she had a pit buck for a cutie mark, I was remarkably terrified at the thought that I might lose it. As best I could parse the buck's attitude, these slavers had seen pit bucks before and had ways to remove them. The buck threw a lever, and the fence around us once again crackled and hummed. With a rending grind, the huge metal inner gate of the wall began to lower on massive chains. A drawbridge, complete with a moat on the inner side of the wall. My pit buck began to click urgently as it picked up the radiation seeping out of the sludge. The wall was clearly meant to keep any pony from getting out as much as prevent ponies from getting in. Beyond, I got my first glimpse of the inner city, Philadelphia. Slave masters stood ground over mesh-covered work pits, wearing barding and gas masks, pointing weapons down to those poor ponies laboring beneath at the point of exhaustion. I couldn't tell what work they were doing, but I could tell they were filthy, sick, and trembling. A chimney rose out of the nearest work pit, hellish red tint, exhaust pouring out of it. I gagged at the stench of unwashed ponies and noxious fumes. A swath of bright yellow and green fluttered around the chimney before perching on a nearby pile of rubble. Pyrolite! She cocked her head at me. I was not alone. Behold! cried out the voice of Red Eye. We stand on the threshold of a new dawn. With every factory we, we recover, every mill we rebuild, we move one big step forward towards an equestria where our children can live in the safety and control and comfort of modern cities, not grovel in the dilapidated ruins of the past. With the stone and glass and steel forged by these, we can rebuild the homes and towers and lanes of mass transportation that will bestow freedom and prosperity upon generations to come. This, my children, is the very last generation that needs to cringe in caves and scramble for 200 years scrap food. The Philadelphia broadcast poured out of the speakers from everywhere. The messages and music were non-stop. The constant companion of both slave master and slaves. Nash pulled the wagon past several more work pits before drawing to a stop in what had once been a chariot lot. I coughed. My pit buck was not shy about informing me that the gas pouring out from the work pit smokestacks was poisonous. The guards had gas masks, but they appeared apparently couldn't spare any for the slaves. I trembled with anger. The rate of attrition here must be unconsciousable. The lot was full of caged wagons, most of them recently emptied by their other wagon pullers, who were amassing slaves in an open area on the pavement. The gate I had come through was not the only one, and I was not the only new arrival. Nash opened my cage and stuck his head in, biting at the chain between my shackles and hauling me roughly out. I was dragged with a throng of suffering ponies, each of whom had clearly been through weeks of torment before even getting here. A large black griffin in dark gray talon barding landed on the roof adjacent to the chariot lot and turned her white feathered head 
to scowl at us. Above her head rose a banner that fluttered in the wind. Red Eye's flag. She had a whipped curl, a curl under one wing, and an anti-machine rifle strapped to her back. The work is hard, yes. Red Eye's voice continued out of the nearest speaker as the griffin above scanned the miserable gloop of ponies beneath her. But only through the generous gift of our efforts can our children and our children's children have a better world. We must selflessly give all we can so that a new equestria may rise. And that is not an easy thing to ask. Honestly, Red Eye, I don't see much asking going on. Tribals care only about their own small groups, unwilling or unable to view the larger picture. Raiders and Steel Rangers are just the epitome of selfishness, caring only for their own base desires and outdated codes, taking what they want from the rest of us and giving nothing back. But here, today, and every day, we give back. We create. Where others only know how to tear down, we build. And that, my children, is how we pave the way for... One of the other wagon pullers shouted at us, making more ponies cringe, and one actually burst into tears. Make yourselves presentable, you worthy mules! The griffin's expression suddenly turned from something resembling mild contempt to cold anger. She drew the massive antimaterial rifle faster than I would have thought possible. The report of the gun was like a righteous anger of Luna. The wagon puller was ripped in two, the bullet punching through the asphalt and burying itself deep in the ground. A few of the ponies screamed. A magenta mare with an orange mane began backpedaling, trying to keep her hooves out of the spreading pool of blood. Her terror-stricken face splattered with what looked a part of the dead slaver's stomach lining. We are not animals. We are not zebras. We are ponies. We have a better nature and a higher calling. We know that the road is hard, and yet we stand and face the challenge. We know that many of us may suffer and perish and never taste the sweet fruits of our labor. But out of generosity and hope, we give ourselves away so that the others may know a better future. Because of that, that future is worth any sacrifice. And yes, the new Equestria does demand sacrifices. Okay, but pony sacrifices? Red Eye's speech ended. The music began again, uplifting and regal. The griffin looked not at us, but at the cowering slavers. You do not interrupt when Red Eye is talking. She turned to us. My name is Stern, the griffin stated looking down on her new slaves. And this is my town. <clears throat> you are workers, Stern informed us as she paced along the rooftop above. You work towards the building of a brighter tomorrow, towards the new Equestria, which will be populated by the Unity. Your work is the gift that you will give to the future. And you can either give it willingly or Red Eye will give it for you. I found myself conflicted. I seethed at the treatment of the slave ponies, which amounted to nothing short of slow and torturous murder. And yet, I understood Red Eye's goal. Maybe not all of it. The whole unity thing was downright creepy. But the progress? The striving to make a world a better place at any cost? The same drive it kept me flanked deep in blood, and I was not apologetic for it. Rather, will put you to work, doing things we probably should be working together towards anyway, although by choice and to safer conditions. Me? I'll put a blow through your head if you are raping, murdering, blight on pony kind. In both cases, we had decided that ponies who don't choose to live their lives by the right way had forfeited the right to live freely, 
if at all. There was a difference. There was a line between Red Eye and me. It just wasn't as thick as I would have liked. Even so, it didn't change the plan I was seeing and hearing all around me. And that these horrors had to stop. But, most of you don't really care about the future, do you? I can see it in your eyes. You don't give a crap about other ponies. You just want your precious freedom. Well, then, listen closely, because I'm going to tell you how to free yourselves. Stern said, her voice gruff with disgust and conviction. Part of me wanted to cry out that I didn't care, but a much stronger part of me listened intently. Unless I could find a screwdriver and an unguarded place to hide, this might be my best choice and chance. You earn it! Of course you do, I thought. But Stern was quick to expound on that concept. You can toil in the mills and in the factories and in the workhouses till you drop. Or you can volunteer for more dangerous jobs. Those who do are rewarded. Red Eye is a very generous stallion. He gives you three options. The Griffin held up three razor sharp talons and began tickling them down. You can choose to work on Stable Recovery Team. There are a lot of stables in the Philadelphia area, each rich in resources. But stables tend to be dangerous. They often have their own security on their own. Quite dangerous. I shuddered, feeling a fresh wave of fury. The Griffin scowled. And of course, there are the Steel Rangers, who also offer the same prize. And before you start getting any wrong ideas, let me warn you. The Steel Rangers have adopted a slaughter-first attitude towards anyone that stands in the way of their precious stable tech property. They will slaughter you as quickly as they will slaughter us. And in the rare cases, where the stables have still living residents, they usually slaughter them too. At least Red Eye gives them the same option he gives you. My eyes went wide. My jaws dropped. Luna raped them with her horn. You work for two years on a stable recovery team and survive, and Red Eye promises you freedom. You'll be tagged, and will be allowed to live wherever you live like to choose. The Griffin gave a knowing smile. So long as you don't decide to become a bother. Two years. That was not an option. But I was really wasn't really thinking about it. I was thinking about how Blueberry Saber and I were going to have some very, very harsh words. And that was already concerning what ammo to use as punctuation. Curling her second claw, Stern continued. You can work in the Philadelphia Crater. Red Eye has need of radioactive materials, and the crater is a treasure trove of them. If Blueberry Saber was to be believed, it would have been stupid for her to lie about my objectives. Then she would then I knew why Red Eye was mining the crater. He needed materials for his rat engine. But working at ground zero of a mega spell strike. Even the radiation protective barding was a death sentence. Red Eye has stated that any pony who works for six months worth of full work days in the Philadelphia Crater will be treated for radiation sickness and freed. A falsely kind smile crossed her beak. But since he's a charitable stallion, Red Eye has reduced it only to four months. I suspect most ponies suffered fatal poisoning within three. Your third option, Stern informed us, holding up the remaining talon, is to fight in the pit. The pit is a combat area. Pony against pony. Each event has six rounds, and there is usually an event once every week. More if Reddy himself graces us with his presence. The Griffin stared down at us, assessing the pathetic herds of new slaves. 
If you survive six consecutive events, not only do you gain your beloved freedom, but you gain an honored place in the Red Eye Army. She stood up tall, glowering. But frankly, none of you lot look worthy of such an honor. The black body griffin snorted. Still, I am honor bound to give you the option. Just try not to make it too easy for your opponent if you do. Then, scowling yet again at us, she warned. These are the ways to earn your freedom, but there are two more ways to gain it. You may, at any time, choose to join the Unity. If you do, your fate will be in the hooves of the goddesses. She said, as if the world was distasteful. Or, of course, you can gain freedom through death. Try to think stupid, try to rebel, try to fight, try to run. Any of those are fine ways to die horribly. Stern fixed us all with a stare. But that is all they are. Welcome to the Philadelphia Fun Farm! A weathered, oversized image of Pinkie Pie's head and four hooves peered over the top of the arched, wrought iron gateway. Beyond lie the decaying ruins of what had once been a massive amusement park. I remembered it from the poster in Steel Hooves Shack. Everything from everything the Grand Galloping Gala should have been. Every day, forever. We were herded through the gateway. A fair bulk of the now old amusement park had been converted into slaves quarters. I had been assigned a straw mat somewhere in an enclosement where ponies once galloped around in mock-ups of plow wagons, ramming each other for fun. Being new, I didn't rate four walls, only a roof. And I was told to be glad for that. The rain in Philadelphia, they warned me, burned. On the pathway to the gate, path up to the gateway, I had spotted slaves harnessed to actual plow wagons, pushing mounds of rubble as they pulled a chariot behind them, carrying the slave master pony, who whipped them if they weren't going fast enough. Or, if the slave master liked the sound the poor silk pony made, when struck brutally with a lash. Or, if he was just bored. I wonder if any of these tortured ponies spent their nights sleeping in the bummer plowed pit. Sometimes, ironically sucked. Once, Colton and Phillies would drag their parents from miles around to romp and play in the silly rides and spectacles the Philadelphia Fun Farm provided. Now, it was a monstrous monument to slavery and death, wrapped in garish, peeling paint. Pinkie Pie wouldn't approve. Above us, three Pinkie Pie balloons floated in constant orbit over the decaying amusement park. One moved freely, the other two were anchored, one apiece to the one tallest building standing within the center of the wall. The first was leashed to an old hotel, beaten but unbroken, which towered just a few blocks away from the eastern edge of the Philadelphia Fun Farm. The huge lettering on the 20th floor balcony was nearly rusted away and had long ago lost its lighting. But even without it, I would have recognized the Alpha Omega Hotel from its small picture in that old news article I'd seen a couple days ago. The second Pinky Pie balloon was bound to a building rising out of the fun farm itself. It was clearly stylized as a barn, looking like nothing so much as a colossal virgin of the old building on Sweet Up Lakers. The first floors were covered in gaily colored murals and fairy tale creatures most of which had slid from the creek a piece of childlike flavory into the valley of disturbing imagery. The roller coaster that looped around the amusement park actually just passed through the building on the sixth floor. A huge radio tower jutted from the top, modified to look like a comically oversized weather vane. I realized that I was looking at the Philadelphia hub 
of the Ministry of Morale. I should have known. Pinkie Pie and her ministry had created the SpriteBots. The source of the SpriteBots broadcast had to be a ministry hub somewhere. It wasn't powerful enough to reach all the way to Manhattan, but with each SpriteBot read broadcasting, the signal, the Ministry Morale's reach, had been effectively infinite. When Red Eye had taken the hub, he had simply added his sermons to the playlist. The music itself was the same songs that the Ministry of Morale had been broadcasting since before the war. As if mocking me from a revelation, the plucky, harp cordish number played over the speakers suffered a sudden influx of lyrics. You gotta share. You gotta care. It's the right thing to do. I really, really wanted a gun. Oh look, called out a blood red mare, whose dark green mane was done up in spikes. She was lounging on a spe specular railing of the bumper plow arena. Fresh meat. The slave master ponies walking with us took their leave. Gnash gave me a parting look that I couldn't interpret. Then we were alone with the other slaves. Many paid us no mind. Most even spared us a glance, did so with a sad, resigned expressions. I felt sickness at the sight of them. Many were shedding their manes and coats, revealing boils or discolored flesh beneath, or suffering from withered limbs or sloughing facial features, the slowly dying victims of radiation poisoning. And then there were the bullies. The blood-red mare slid from the railing and stalked towards us. Listen up, my little grubworms, she barked. Her cutie mark looked like an eyeball on a pike. I shuddered, wondering just how you end up with a cutie mark like that. Blueberry Saber had warned that I might not, that I might have more to fear from the inmates than the guards. The other pony joined her, a hulking, piss-colored male pony with an ugly scar and the cutie mark of a very angry yellow flower. I got the absurd feeling that the flower wanted to kill me. The school in Stable 2 had bullies, and these ponies reminded me of them. No matter how powerless we all were, they could find power by making the rest of us feel even more miserable. It was contemptible at best. With every pony suffering, I felt it was vile that some of the slaves themselves would go out of their way to make it worse for others. I had learned the best way to gain strength was through friendship. Shouldn't we all be working together? But this was faster and easier for the selfish. I'm blood, the appropriately colored mare with the spiked mane announced. Then, introducing her over-muscled buck, and this is Daff. The lug stared at us, his eyes lingering on the mares. I know y'all just heard Stern's big spiel about how Philadelphia is her town, Blood said, which I bet she wouldn't have dared if the griffin was anywhere nearby. Well, the bumper plow pit is our domain. What a glorious empire you have here. I snarked on my breath before I could stop myself. Blood looked like she'd been slapped. Excuse me? She trotted up, eyes narrowing. Did you just talk? Because it sounded like you talked. Now I don't remember telling you to. Why couldn't I keep my mouth shut? Well, at least maybe if she kicks the crap out of me, she managed to crush all the biting bugs in my coat while she was at it. Then again, maybe it was a good thing I had her attention. If I became the bully's new chew toy, then that would spare the other slaves at least some of their tensions. I'd faced a dragon. I could take the crap these two could dish. Okay, I ran away from a dragon, but that's just getting nitpicky. Well, did you just talk? Blood demanded, sticking her snout against mine. She had to lower her head a little to do so, something I could see she enjoyed. My small, small stature made me a particularly appealing target. I 
I just said, what a glorious empire you have, you know, with a crumbling amusement park ride. I stammered, cringing back. You must be so proud. Her eyes widened. Oh, you are begging me to mess you up. She lifted a hoof and brought it down on the chin of my manacles, driving my face into the dirt. Okay, Philly, this is life from now on. You speak when I tell you to speak. You lick where I tell you to lick. And if you give me half your damn food rations every night, and maybe, just maybe, I'll keep you for myself, rather than letting Daft here have you every Luna damn night until he splits you in two. I looked up at her, putting on a pitiful expression. Daff, she called back to the piss-colored brute. Fuck her up bad. The lumbering brute approached me with a nasty grin. With pleasure. He spun and kicked. Hard. Pain exploded through my breast. I found myself flying back through the air, and I crashed through the rotten remains of what had once been a hot dog stand, with a picture of Pinkie Pie slathering out the mustard. I was struggling to get to my feet, when he slammed me into me at full gallop, setting me sprawling. I thought I'd heard a rib crack. Breathing was becoming painful. The buck trotted up to me as I fought to catch my breath and reared up. Without armor, I was afraid he'd break my back, so I twisted. He compensated, his hooves coming down on my stomach, knocking any wind I had out of me. I coughed, tasting blood. The huge buck positioned himself over me, my horn glowing softly as I wrapped a very tender point of him in the telekinetic sheath and gave him a warning squeeze. Daft stopped abruptly. Here's the deal, I whispered, half moaning in pain. You decide I'm not worth your attentions. That way, you get to save face. And in return, I'll show you just how good I am at this particular trick. I squeezed a little harder, and the buck jolted with pain, sweating now. And you keep yourself to yourself, and away from the other slaves, or the deal's off. A slight bit tighter, and Daff nodded feverently, tears spilling from his eyes, as he tried not to scream. Deal? I asked, even though I knew he already agreed, as I gave him the telekinetic field a slight twist. His reaction was utterly worth it. Good, I growled, a mouth tasting of warm copper. I released him, dropping my head back as my vision swam. I needed a medical pony. I needed Velvet Remedy. Shaking himself, Daff made a show of staring me up and down, then dismissing me with a huff. Fuck that! He said too loudly. She's so tiny, it'd be like fucking a kid. He turned around. Blood was looking at him, with one eye narrowed in disbelief. Death glanced back over his shoulder at me. Snorted, apparently deciding that he could and couldn't get away with it. He drove his right hind tooth back, the gruesomely hard half buck. I landed directly between my hind legs, then trotted away, basking in the blood-colored mare's obvious approval. I'd never screamed so hard in my life. I have walked through the streets of Philadelphia, cleared of rubble, and seen the steel mill producing steel, the textiles mill producing cloth, and the power plant producing power. Rara's voice sounded proud through the tiny speaker on the steel poles that jutted through the ruddy evening ear, air. <clears throat> it is a start, but such a glorious start, and we owe it all to each other. What is this? I asked, half whimpering, as a bowl of indescribable mush stuffed stuff 
was shoved in my shoved in front of my nose. The smell made me deeply bruised stomach convulse in revulsion. Oatmeal, the slave pony claimed flatly, scooping off the bowl the same discolored glob for the next pony. Oatmeal? Are you crazy? I stared in disbelief. This doesn't look anything like oatmeal. Or smell. Or, I added, as another portion of the muck, sloth, brought ladled to bowl. Sound. I gave half of the oatmeal to blood, feeling like I was the one being cruel. Then I limped around until I found another pony that had been bullied out of his share and gave him the rest. I was in too much pain in tender places, including my stomach, to attempt eating anyway. In turn, he gave me very depressing advice on continued existence as a worker in Philadelphia. Don't choose the crater. Most ponies who go there don't live even three months, much less four. Don't choose the pit. They'll have to survive as many as 36 battles against other slaves to make it. And the battles are always to the death. I moaned at that. I couldn't see myself taking the life of another slave. Well, maybe blood and daft, but not the innocent ones. He himself worked in the scrapyards, using a tool he called an auto axe to cut apart chariots and other huge hunks of metal for melting down in the steel mill. It was dangerous work, and they were kept under supervision by guards in high places. But there weren't any whips. No slave master was going to get in the scrapyard with a slave wielding a spinning blade, magically enchanted to slash easily through metal. He regaled me with the many ways to die in Philadelphia. One of the least pleasant ways was to work the was the work the pits I had seen on the way in. But fortunately, he said, those are reserved for ponies who try to escape, or worse, sabotage Red Eye's work. What are they? Philadelphia has a bit of a parasprite problem, the pony told me as he ate the remainder of my glop. Apparently, there was a massive infestation, maybe three or four decades before the mega spells. Supposedly, they wiped it out. But parasprites are really persistent. He licked the bowl while trying not to gag. A couple years back, Red Eye's bucks were blasting their way into one of the stables that was pretty close to the crater and cleared open a pocket full of the damn things, all irradiated to hell and nastier than ever. Blood sprites? I asked, but he shook his head. Nah, blood sprites is what happened to parasprites. The guy that was tainted. Big, and I mean, big and mean, but don't tend to reproduce. And that's a blessing. You trust me on that. I looked around me gravely. These little buggers are irradiated. Big difference. So, what do they do? Same thing that I've done. Always done. Eat and spit out more. The pony fixed me with a stare. Only now, they're carnivores. They eat ponies? Oh, Celestia. And those chimneys. The buck cocked his head. Well, that's where we incinerate the nests we find. Only way to make sure they stop reproducing is to kill them with fire. He scowled. Problem is, Sometimes there are ones deep in the nests that don't properly cook by the exterminations. They wake up from the heat, fly out, and mesh over the working pits, making sure they don't get that far. And one of the guards always has a flamethrower, especially after that one mare had one of them bugs fly at her throat. They ate her from the inside out. Pure nightmare fuel. I really wish I could unhear that. But as bad as that was, on the top of his list of ways to die, 
was unity. I know back, I know that that bastard Red Eye says, but I've known plenty of ponies who volunteered for unity, and not one of them has ever come back. He confided to me. According to some ponies, goddesses, whatever that's supposed to be, is turn them into those big alicorn critters who we sometimes see hereabouts. But if that's true, then I figured there would be a lot more of them. And you'd think one would bother to come back and say hello to friends, being that they can fly and all. I didn't think it helpful to tell him that there were probably more of them than he thought. My mind was already processing the other information. The pseudo-goddesses had no cutie marks, and were at least guided through te a telepathic source. My mind reeled with the possibility that transformation removed their individuality and sense of self completely. Doing that to a pony would be worse than murder. Night was chilly, and I had no blanket. I lay on the rat-chewed old mat, which had been a bed to slaves before me, most of whom were probably dead now. The mat was so worn it felt harder than the cement beneath, and so stained that I didn't really want to touch it. But it was all I had. My body was badly bruised, and it still ached to breathe. My mid rib had been cracked, but thankfully not broken, and I tried wholeheartedly to ignore the worse of the lower pain. Part of me wanted to kill Daft as painfully and bloodily as possible. Part of me wanted to curl up and cry. I fought down both. Considering what I did and threatened to do to the piss-colored bastard, I think part of me wanted to show that I could take what I was willing to do and dish it out. Mostly, though, I had told him he could save face, and as much as I hated it, I had acknowledged that is exactly what he did. The sky above was black, with reflective tinges of orange and red. With the fall of night, all the forges and fires and other glowing things were more pronounced, giving the Philadelphia ruins an infernal cast. The worst was the subtle red tinge in the air that became a luminous and glow within the massive pit where the megaspell carrying missile had struck. Missing the massive industrial sectors of the city to fend the heart of civilian housing. Darkness never truly felt in the core of the Philadelphia crater. crater. A gust of wind brought a deeper chill and a choking, acid-ridden smell with it from somewhere deeper in Philadelphia. A few of the other slaves coughed in their sleep. I shivered and tried to breathe without inhaling. I missed my friends. I wondered if they were okay. In my mind, I had begun to play through all the mistakes I had made. All the ways my plan could have gone wrong. Somewhere, not far away, I caught sight of a small burst of green flame. Getting up, I slipped out quietly, bringing my eyes forward sparkle to help me find the Balefire Phoenix. My heart felt thankful for the company as I spotted her perched on a high sign shaped like a smiling pinky pie, holding up a hoof. You must be this tall to ride the fun farm wheel. Behind her, the massive iron structure of the wheel rose above the park like a mechanical eye, watching us, balefully. Palefire hooted musically at me. Thank you, I told her earnestly. I didn't think I could make it through this trial alone. I considered asking her questions, or a question that she ferry a message to Velvet Remedy, or half a dozen other things that I dismissed in turn. Instead, I chose to just sit there, resting my head against the two-dimensional Pinkie Pie, and enjoying her company. Well, let's put you to work, Mr. Shiny said, looking me over. Mr. Shiny was the slave master pony in charge of assigning work to new slaves, and I thought he had a deceptively kind voice. I see you have a pick buck, and that you should be tagged for a visit with Dr. Slaughter, but I figure we can hold off on that. He gave me a smile that seemed 
personable, but had no real warmth. What do you say we put that thing to work, instead? I was still terribly sore, and walked with a slight limp, but he didn't seem to notice, or at least not care. I wasn't sure he'd put ponies to work, who were in much worse shape. What do I have to do? Well, there's a building in town that's been infested with Paris Brights. But this time, we can't just go in with flamethrowers, so we could use a pony with a pit buck. Mr. Shiny explained. That thing can spot targets for you, right? We'll send you in there, in an environmental barding, and with a low-powered magical energy gun. Shoot the damn things, till they're piles of ash. How... how many are there? The fretful nightmares of the night before replayed themselves in my mind. Shouldn't be more than 50. They haven't had anything to snack on since the infestation was discovered. Poor Whitetail. Within half an hour, he had me equipped and ready to go. Except for ammo. I'd get that after I entered the building. They'd shove it in through the mail slot. Beams of bright magenta magical energy laced through the air at me from the security turret in the hallway ceiling. One of the blasts struck my environmental suit, melting a hole in the size of a hoof just below my cutie mark and burning my flesh underneath. As I threw myself behind a desk, I hoped it wouldn't scar like the slash on my neck. The terminal on the desk glowed softly and had the same sickly pale green that almost all the others did. I hid myself behind it as I began to hack the system. It took only a moment. The terminal security was pathetic, and I was in luck. The terminal could shut down the turrets. The turret lets loose another barrage of pink energy. Several lacing bolts struck the backside of the terminal. It exploded in my face with a blast of sparks. I would have been permanently blinded, if not outright killed, had the environmental suit not included a gas mask and heavy goggles. I cringed back behind the desk. I considered my options. Until now, the big hunt was more frustrating than dangerous. The barding had made me effectively immune to the Paris Brights, and I had become so practiced in the art of stealth that I could sneak right up behind one before the half-blind fangs spotted me, which was good, since I had almost no skill with magical weaponry. Even at close range, even with sats, I missed as often as I hit. As the turret spewed out another barrage, a little yellow parasprite flew towards me, drawn by the smell of my burning flesh. I slipped into sats as, I drew, as it drew close, aiming the laser and firing. I hit it with a third shot, and it disintegrated into a flash of turquoise ash. I dropped the targeting spell, and then kicked it back up a second later. Tell me to take down two more Paris Brights, one of which was approximately the color of a dead fish. I think I'm in trouble. I checked the magic spark pack. These, these second two had taken me five shots to vaporize. Better, but still not good. According to my Pip Buck's initial scan, there were 52 Paris Sprites in the building that I had to wipe out. And I had just killed Paris Sprites numbered 17 through 21. That left 31 more to go, most of which I knew were swarming around the building's factory floor, an area I had been avoiding, choosing to clear out the rest of the building first. Only now they smelled flesh. I had seven shots left. Really in trouble. The turret poured out even more magical energy trying to strike me down. Not smart enough to realize there was a whole big metal desk in the way. The desk was getting warm to the touch. If I didn't find more ammo in this place, or even better, another weapon, I opened the desk, just to check. Bottle caps. Three of them. I screamed out in frustration. I looked around, spotted a door marked maintenance nearby. Wrapping the desk in a field of levitation, I carried it alongside me as a shield while I dashed for the door. It was locked. 
I still didn't have a screwdriver. Looking towards the heavens. If either of you two are actually up there, I'm really sorry for doubting. Really sorry. I apologize. Now, could you please send me a break? And the turn fired again. The desk was no longer just warm. It was beginning to irradiate heat. Three more Paris sprites flew into the room, drawn by my smell. Well then, fuck you two. Both of you. I shouted upwards. Go lick each other's... I slid into sats and sent a flurry of targets of, of targeting spell-guided shots at the Parasprites. Two turned to ash. The third was struck, falling to the floor, but not dying. The other shots missed, and now I was out. I panted, a rib injury burning, and making it hurt to breathe. Damn it! The turret fired again. The desk was now glowing. In frustration, I snapped. You want this so much? Here! Take it! Keeping the desk between me and the turret, I floated it up and offered it to the machine and slammed it over and over again until it stopped working with a crunch. Then, floating it past me the other way, I flipped it over and dropped the glowing metal surface on the wounded blue, bu blue bug. I managed to close myself in an office above the building's main floor. The hallway that the turret had been protecting had led to this room, the equivalent of an overmare's office. There was a small door on one side that probably led to a closet and massive plate glass windows that looked out over the main work area. I stared out one of the windows at the massive, the massive cute, colorful predators swarming between the catwalks above and the printing presses below. Same aesthetic, I noted dourly. It was like the world before had a hard-on for industrial accidents. I also now understood why going in flamethrowers was not such a good option. This building was a printing house, and a lot of it was full of books, posters, a variable cornucopia of fuel for an out-of-control fire. Such a fire would probably destroy the very thing I was sure Red-Eye was after in the process, or the presses. I had to applaud the stallion. He had power, steel, and textiles, and now he was working on bringing back mass publication. As far as I could tell, the only book that had been written and distributed on any significant scale since the apocalypse was the Wasteland Survival Guide. Getting this place running would be a major step forward. The school he was promising suddenly began to look real. I spotted several more automated turrets covering the main floor. Damn things ignored the bugs, but I knew they'd attack if I so much as stepped a hoof in the room. I was in no shape to deal with that. Many parish brights, much less the damn turrets. The room had a desk with a still functioning terminal. I sat down and began to hack, hoping I could turn off the other turrets from here. The password, interestingly, was Generous Souls. Welcome to the Ministry of Image Philadelphia Hub, Miss Periwinkle. How are you doing this fine morning? It has been 202 years, 70, 37 days, 1 hour, and 13 minutes since your last logon. Would you like to check your messages? Wait, this was a hub? But there wasn't anything here. It was a small building, little more than a print shop. There was nothing here. That made no sense. It wasn't a tower. It was two stories tall. And I'd seen enough of the building to be pretty sure it didn't have any secret sublevels. There weren't many offices, nothing more than what had been expected of a small publishing house. I got up and started looking around. There were posters on the walls of the office, and many more visible down on the printing room floor. I had seen most of them before. Everything from the Progress posters on the Ministry of Warfarm Technology, to the image of Twilight Sparkle above the words, Reading is Magic, the poster I had seen in the Ponyville Library, only without the disfiguring graffiti. I glanced back to the terminal 
I noticed something else. On the desk was an old album. I opened it, and began magically flipping through the pages. All the full and collected scraps. Old newspaper articles, flyers, public notifications. Most were decayed beyond readability. Of those that weren't, many were familiar. The clinic warning about wartime stress disorder, for example. One of the barely readable newspaper articles caught my eye. Dragon over Hoofington. The Shadow Bolts, led by Rainbow Dash, engaged a dragon, the Dragon Brimstone, over the skies of Hoofington last week as Zebra Forces managed their deepest strike into Equestria in the war's 13 year history. All rumors that the Zebras have enlisted the aid of the dragons native to their homeland has been confirmed. Princess Luna vows to expand Equestria's Pegasus. The rest was continued on another page. The rest of this one was a picture of Rainbow Dash standing proudly on the head of the fallen monster. It was the sort of image that would have branded Rainbow Dash as a natural hero in the minds of ponies for generations. I closed the book and looked back at the screen. I began to understand. I thought back to Pinkie Pie poster that first alerted me to the existence of the Ministries. If I had been asked what I would have said about the Ministry morale, had been the first I'd seen. I would have been wrong. The Ministry of Image was the first one I had seen. Well, it hadn't gone by that name. It almost never went by that name. At least, not externally. In fact, I suspected the principles of proper pony speech was supposedly supposed to be an internal document the Ministry of Image didn't seem to do project of its own. It worked in service of the other ministries. It created their materials, their books, their posters, their flyers. And in one case, even their armor. Every poster associated with one of the ministries. Hell, probably every time I'd ever seen or heard anything about them, I was seeing from the Ministry of Image. The invisible ministry that was everywhere. I downloaded Miss Periwinkle's messages into my pit buck for later perusal, then moved on to the more pressing task of dealing with turrets. I had hoped I could turn off the turrets to the terminal in what I considered the Overmare's office, but the terminal had allowed me to do one better. It allowed me the, to reprogram the turrets to wipe out the Paris Brights. I crouched behind the desk, listening to the barrage of turret fire fill the main floor of the MI hub. The Paris Bright's kill count on my pit buck had just shot up to 39 and was only now beginning to slow. I realized I would have to hunt down the last ones, the ones in rooms and spaces the turrets didn't cover. But suddenly, my job was a lot easier. My luck just kept improving. There was a bathroom off to the side of this office. The toilet water made my pit buck freak, and the sink was completely non functional. A plumber pony had been working on it when the mega spell hit. Her skeleton was still in the room. She had been killed by a chunk that fell from the ceiling. There wasn't much left of her maintenance uniform, but it was enough to patch the hole in my environmental suit with the aid of wonder glue. And there had been several bottles of the latter in the pony's toolbox, along with a wrench and squee, a screwdriver. There had also been a feebly locked medical box with a few healing bandages and a couple extra bobby pins and a tin of mintals. I stared at the tin for the longest time, finding the urge to just go ahead and take one. Just one. It took effort to shut the box, leaving them aside. I relocked it. Never again. I was finally out of those damn shackles. I had noticed that most of the other slaves weren't wearing them, so I was fairly certain that I could get away with not wearing them. But if I hadn't gotten myself them off myself, I suspected there wasn't anyone here with both the know-how and kindness to have helped me out. 
I really hated Philadelphia. The turret fire stopped. To be on the safe side, I shut them down completely before stepping out to the office. My pet box said I had five to go, and I was out of ammo still. I needed a plan. Moving back the way I arrived, I tried unlocking the maintenance room that had been, I had been kept out of earlier. With any luck, there would be more magical spark batteries inside. The door clicked open, but my streak of luck had ended, ended. There was no magical spark packs, no weapons or ammo of any kind. Instead, there was a skeleton of a Pegasus pony who had locked himself inside, alone, with a now empty bottle of Buck and a case of painkillers. From the position of the skeleton and the disarray of the room, I suspected he died in severe convulsions, but hopefully unable to feel them. There were a few posters, well preserved, on the wall of this room that I had never seen before. A rather fantastic poster for the Pegasi aerial acrobatics team called the Wonderbolts, whose bright blue uniforms were clearly copied from the darker, militaristic Shadowbolts design. Or was it the other way around? A Fred newspaper article on the wall read, Wonderbolt's heroic attempt to free zebra captives leaves four dead. This morning, Princess Celestia announced the successful rescue of the 17 ponies held captive for two weeks by zebra gem pirates. The Wonderbolts, Equestria's greatest flyers, volunteered for the secret mission that sent them into zebra waters. However, success came at a grave cost, as four members of the elite Pegasi team were killed in the ensuing battle. Thankfully, none of the captives were killed, and only one received a serious injury. Throughout the two-week crisis, the zebra uh, Caesar repeatedly denounced the actions of the pirates and offered support to Princess Celestia, but he denied permission for Equestria ponies to enter zebra territories claiming it would increase existing tensions, and insisting that his army, intelligence, indicated that the pirates were operating in international seas. The zebra Caesar continues to disavow any knowledge of where the pirate ship had anchored. Princess Celestia claims that the Wonderbolt's operation in zebra territory was the result of happy miscommunication and apologized personally to the Caesar. The article clearly predated the beginning of the war. One more thing to think about later, when I wasn't trying to find a way to disintegrate, disintegrate Paris Brights without a magical energy weapon, or incinerate them without fire. The maintenance room included a workbench and a variety of odds and ends, including the box Wonderbolt's lunchbox and a sack filled with some pony's badly decayed porn collection. Mostly old copies of Wing Boner magazine. I managed not to look. No, really. Okay, maybe just a little. Pegasus mares are kinda... exotic, after all. Inspiration struck. I dumped out the magazines and set the sack aside. Then I emptied the lunchbox of the muck of the food inside had rotted to. I brought it up to the schematic that Ditsy Doo had given me as a gift. I didn't really expect a handmade mine would be any good against parish sprites, but that didn't mean I wouldn't find a use for one later. I was about to put my new mine into the sack when I had another idea. I couldn't see the damn pony eating bugs on fire inside the building, but half an hour later I trotted out of the printing house a sack full of angry Paris sprites floating next to me. Oh, Pyrelight! I sing-songed with a smile. Mr. Shiny was most impressed, and I felt myself flushed with pride, only for the pride to be swiftly followed by shame and anger that I was letting myself feel happy about slave work. And worse, thankful to one of the slavers for praising me. The reward for my efforts was to have the magical energy gun taken from me, but in return, he offered his, me a set of ragged slave barding. It offered little protection, but it was far better than n none, and would help against the chilly nights. The former wearer 
according to Mr. Shiny, was no longer able to use it due to decapitation. Working swiftly it did not lead to rest, but more work. I was assigned to the scrapyard for the rest of the day. I spent all of ten minutes getting instructions on the use of gruesome looking auto axe before the yard foreman, a slave himself, decided he just didn't want such a dangerous tool in the hooves of such a small and weak looking mare. I pointed out that, as a unicorn, I was more than capable of wielding the metal cutting saw, regardless of my physical size or strength. In response, he put me to work gathering bits of scrap that the other workers, slaves damn it, were slicing off to old passenger wagons and other sizable metal artifacts of the past. I trudged into the air-splitting din of the scrapyard. Dozens of ponies were pitting those spinning, magically-edged blades against metal. At least a dozen more were on scrap collection duty. I looked up to see the slaver guard staring down at us, armed with battle saddles or assault carbines, keeping well out of range of the auto axes. A daring unicorn could try and float one up at them, but she would be gunned down before she could kill more than one. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a gorgeous yellow and green plumage of pyrolite as she circled, a wonderful slunch box clenched in her talons before soaring out of sight. Smiling to myself a little, despite my dreary situation, I got to work. Enslaved ponies crying out under the whips of slavers pulled wagons piled with scavenged metal into the steel yard for slicing. I was shocked when several ponies trudged wearily into the scrapyard, pulling a wagon laden with a massive gear-shaped steel door from a stable. My work was much easier than theirs, thanks to my magic, and it afforded me a chance to speak with the other slaves. They were not a chatty bunch, quick to remind me that too much talk made the slavers nervous, and was quite quick way to get your tongue cut out, but I was still able to glean a few tidbits which convinced me that the only places likely to find either the schematic for the rat engine or Red Eye's research to bypass spells were the Alpha Omega Hotel or the Ministry of Morale Hub. The Alpha Omega was being used for special housing. For the lower floors, this meant housing for pit fighters. Being on the fast track the brutal death at the hooves of other slaves didn't come without compensations. A much nicer place to bed down, shorter work hours, and, if rumors were true, access to a still. Who, or what, was housed in the upper floors was apparently a closely guarded secret. The only other place to get booze in all of Philadelphia, one of the slaves chi uh, claimed, as she let her auto axe cool down before going again at a three yard long section of what had once been a stable wall is the Romer Bar, a slaver hangout on the other side of the wall. A shame, as I decided that I could definitely use some apple whiskey. Cern hates the stuff, says booze makes slavers stupid, and she ain't got a use for stupid. The slave mare with the really strange accent chomped down on the bit of the auto axe, kicking it on again, and started cutting. I hung around long enough to bundle the first chunks of cut from the wall, and floated them back to the waiting bins. Then I moved on. From the ponies willing to talk, everything was about the comically barn-shaped MOM building. It was a mystery, save that there was always a Pinkie Pie balloon anchored there that Stern roosted in the upper tower, and that Red Eye himself had private chambers somewhere within. I found myself speaking with another of the slaves, this time a unicorn buck with a cancerous eye and only three legs. The result not of an accident or cruelty, but a birth defect from having been born to a tribe who had lived too close to the Philadelphia crater before the wall. Our conversation was interrupted when, one by one, the slaves paused their work to look into the sky of black clouds. Several pointed, many whispered. I turned my own head upwards, trying to spot the cause of the commotion. 
It wasn't hard to spot. The a sky chariot was flying overhead, pulled by two griffins. Surrounding it was a wing of alicorns. Welp, 34 and Buck muttered. Looks like Red Eye's here. <laughs>